So we take a few minutes to meditate on Prajnaparamita. How's that?
I'm looking at the, uh, the laptop here to see who's coming in remotely, because you can see it on the big screen. So, <laughs> so I need to like, okay, hi everybody. I don't know what camera I'm on, this one, okay, thank you. <laughs> I think the topic for today is talking about challenges. <clears throat> Mostly the big challenge and uh, for most people and probably in this room is uh, how to find time to meditate, sit still. It's very active. United States, very active, busy, right? We always have things to do. So that's that's the main obstacle. The main obstacle is, or the main um, benefit is time, right? That's the biggest obstacle. So, um, <clears throat> of course, you don't find time, you make time. So we could say the biggest obstacle is the mind, our motivation. <clears throat> But if you, if you have to do uh, something, at least uh, sit quietly. If you're sitting quietly, by and large, you're not being a nuisance, right? So you're <laughs> fulfilling some compassionate activity. Anyway, you're not creating more harm. So at least you're not doing much harm. Of course, if you have to respond to someone in an emergency, you don't want to sit quietly. But most of the time, you know, sitting quietly, we're going to settle down a little bit. The emotions will cool off a little bit or we'll find some peace, or we'll also find motivation. So uh, we, we like good works, we like compassionate activities, um, we want to make efforts in the world, and uh, we like study and knowledge, but um, if you're not meditating, you're probably not integrating it. That's why, you know, really the Buddha is always shown in some kind of meditative posture, just to remind us. Uh, so uh, eventually, you know, if we settle down, then the the mind will settle down, the emotions will settle down, and we'll see clearly. And then from that point, we can uh, do compassionate activity. But, um, people are always willing to do do things, which I like, because of course, the doing has created this wonderful uh, Dharma center. Um, and people uh, generally are always willing to read, you know. This is a reading culture. We're brought up to read, aren't we? Um, but we're not brought up to meditate and sit still, generally. So, uh, I don't know, it's crazy. I mean, for me, I'm just, maybe I'm sedentary <laughs> by nature. But I don't know, as, you know, as a kid, I just kind of just sit there, just quiet. You know. So um, I do like to read and do activities, but um, if you want to be a yogi, call yourself a yogi, you actually, you can't just do good works and um, uh, read books. So of course, I have my scholarly side, but um, we have to really be very clear that um, during the Buddha's lifetime, nothing was written down at all. It was memorized. The talks were memorized. Um, generally, after a, um, a talk, then um, people would just repeat it. You know, they they wouldn't have lunch. We have lunch after the talk, but after <laughs> the Buddha's time, the Buddha would give a, a talk, and then people would reme immediately start repeating it, right? And then they would go meditate. It would be there were professional memorizers like Ananda or something like that. But then, then they would meditate. <clears throat> so, um, if if you always find time to do something other than doing sitting meditation, you're probably off track. Just bluntly, bluntly off track. It lets me know you don't want to be with yourself, really just on a fundamental level, like, I just don't want to sit with myself because that's what's happening in meditation. You're paying attention to just you. 
it's not narcissistic or self-indulgent um, because if we're off track, I can guarantee you're not going to be helpful to other people, right? You'll just make it worse. So, you know, at least let's not make it worse, right? At least do no harm. So, uh, you know, I'd rather have people sit more, we call it in the West, than uh, study more. <clears throat> My friend uh, Tenzin Choki, uh, who's coming here at, um, very soon, February 18th, to work with emotions uh, mindfully, which I really recommend. Still have a few seats left. Um, a few years, several years ago, a number of years ago, he says, oh, I really learned from you, because your phrase is, don't read more than you meditate. You won't absorb it. You're reading these meditation tracks uh, or philosophic tracks. So the philosophic tracks that um, we know from the called Shastras and um, these were the notes, you know? So what happened is teachers, uh, the Buddha, teachers going forward would give lectures, da 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 da. And then students would say, you know, um, we've memorized it pretty well. But, you know, could you just, you know, make it a little bit, you know, put it together, succinct. So sometimes it would be, the teachers would actually write something and most of the time one of their secretaries would write things down. But they started out as talks, right? Which would be followed by meditation. But actually the traditional way is not the way we did it today, meditate and then talk. We would talk and then we'd all, we'd, talk for an hour or class, then you'd meditate an hour, right? Like that. So very bluntly, um, if you think you're a yogi, but you're not meditating that much, you are not. You're a thinker. <laughs> like that. So uh, I don't advocate bad meditation, of course, but um, generally, um, uh, you know, like one of my uh, main Dzogchen teachers, um, who's a student of Dujan Rinpoche, would say, you know, if you sit still, eventually your mind and body, your mind has to come back to your body. The idea is that our body is kind of like a ship on the ocean. And I guess, you know, in the ship, they used to carry birds to uh, do things, maybe pigeons or something like that. Um, uh, and the birds would have to come back. There'd be no else. If there were land birds, there'd be nowhere else to go, right? So all the great teachers, that male and female, or both, or whatever, you know, sitting, 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 practice. One of the most famous ones, of course, was the mountain yogi Milarepa, um, who uh, didn't found a dharma center or a temple or anything. Um, but taught a lot, and the final teaching to one of his main students, Gampopa, uh, was to show him uh, the calluses on his butt from sitting, right? <laughs> that must have been a surprise. He's, you know, this is a great story. Um, I hope it happened this way, you know. And his, Gampopa was leaving after offering mandalas and saying goodbye, the traditional stuff, and got maybe a little ways away and they were saying, come on back, I got one final teaching. And then, and then he mooned him, you know, this is it, you know, practice, right? Like that, you know. <laughs> so um, the students of the Buddha became um, awake and enlightened during this time by uh, listening to you know, very simple, straightforward teachings, right? So there was no all the stuff we have afterwards, right? It's great. I love all the, the teachers up to present teachers, you know, Dalai Lama, Pema Chodron, everybody, you know, Susan Salzberg, all that, you know, but um, they, they didn't, they, they just listened to the talks and then meditated, right? Like that. <clears throat> so uh, the main obstacle is thinking, well, we don't have to meditate that much. We'll just read about it. Or, you know, we don't have to meditate that much, we'll just do good works. 
So the culprit really isn't time, but it's it's the mind that thinks, um, you know, I, there's a shortcut that way. There's no shortcut to spending time with yourself. If you're unwilling to spend time with yourself, particularly when it's difficult, then you're not a yogi. You're not doing it. Because of course, if you sit long enough with yourself, it's not just the body that's going to become uncomfortable. We're going to become uncomfortable with ourselves. Okay? It has to be that way. If you're meditating properly, you're going to reach challenges and obstacles, things you don't like about yourself, but that are challenging or obstacles or, or you know, outrageous passions or crazy ideas, right? If you're doing it properly. And then if you're doing it properly, you're, you're working with those challenges, obstacles, I don't like it world in a, a skillful way. But most people stop. And then, you know, <laughs> so of course, it's easy. It's like, you know, trying to do a garden in Sacramento. So I don't know, a mountain Carmichael. So it's, it's good. The earth is good for about the first six inches. <laughs> Then you hit the hard pan, you know. So obviously there are trees and things growing, so they must grow through the hard pan, right? There, there's got to be a hard pan in the rest of Sacramento, right? Yeah. So um, if you're doing, if you're digging properly, meditating properly, doing the training properly, you're gonna meet these really stuck places because you're supposed to. These are the parts you don't want to see about yourself or see about others your judgments, you know, this, all that yucky stuff that we just like to kind of like, maybe I'm doing it wrong, I'll just stop here. That's a major obstacle, right? Maybe I'm doing it wrong. I'll, when I feel more relaxed, I'll keep meditating. Or um, when I'm on vacation, I'll be better. I'll have a better meditation on the beach. <laughs> so if we're doing it correctly, we're, we're sticking with the obstacles. In daily life, we, it, you know, we're not just having obstacles on a cushion. In daily life, we're having obstacles mainly with other people, okay? So uh, there's uh, a training that is called Lojong, mind training, how to train with other people. So there's some wonderful um, texts about that. Um, maybe a few months ago, Geshe Gendon was here, Eight Verses. It's a very famous text. You know, how, how to work with other people. The jewels in um, Buddhism are the three jewels, uh, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And uh, in Vajrayana, we mentioned the, the teacher, the Lama, because we, we need a personal mentor, personal mirror, personal instruction, which is implied in the Buddha. <clears throat> so, but without practicing all of the jewels, you won't become a Buddha. You cannot ignore the Sangha jewels. You cannot say, well, I'll just meditate and read, um, you know, and then uh, I'll emerge enlightened and then people won't bother me. <laughs> That's kind of a nice fantasy, right? Like, let's go on long retreat. Let's, uh, you know, get totally clear. And then we'll walk into town and people will notice we're different and in line, and then it won't be a drag. It doesn't work that way. So we have to work with others. Working with others, other of us chimpanzees, you know, is the only way we're going to understand really relative self. I mentioned this earlier in the 10 o'clock meditation class. It's easy to understand the nature of phenomena, anything in front of the mind whether it's outer phenomena like tables and chairs and nature, or inner phenomena like um, thoughts and feelings and sensations. It's actually fairly easy to understand the nature of awareness. There's so many texts on that. You, you, you can even say it you know, very succinctly, like nature awareness is clear, open awareness that is unimpeded, right? It's this present nowness. Doesn't that sound great? But it's very difficult to determine the true nature of the self, our identity, who we are. Who's doing all this? So when people are describing 
their meditation objects of phenomena, or even describing their Mahamudra Dzogchen experience, it's not so bad. But when I said, who's doing all this, then there's a problem, right? Please don't point at your nose. <laughs> I'm doing it. <laughs> uh, that's no, all, already that's wrong answer, right? There's no absolute self in Dharma. That saves us a big problem. So we don't have to go searching for that. There's just a relative self that arises in relationship to everything, in relationship to people, primarily in relationship to all kinds of causes and conditions, right? But the only way you're going to see how it works is working with other people. We're going to see how we relate to ourselves because interestingly, human beings can have an inner dialogue with ourselves. But generally, we're not going to get the same feedback to ourselves that we will with other people, particularly our teacher, other Sangha members like that. So even if we do spend a long time in retreat, you know, we eventually do have to come out. We don't want to die in the cave. You know, Milarepa came out of the cave. Padmasambhava came out of the caves. Uh, Jetsuma Tenzin Palma, right? Some people know who that is. Contemporary nun. Okay, 12, what, 12 years in the snow or something? Came in the snow. She's out, right? You know? So she would, okay, I'm, I'm out of the cave. I did the work on myself, with myself. Now I need to do the work with others, right? We're, we're not anchorites. We're not, um, you know, we're not uh, hermits, right? Monastics, definitely not a hermit, right? People think you go to the monastery and suddenly you get all this alone time. <laughs> That's not true, right? No, everyone's in your face all the time. It's, it's prison, right? <laughs> okay, it's like that for a reason. Okay. <clears throat> so a major obstacle is not making the time to meditate. But another major object goal is thinking that we'll understand uh, the true nature of reality without um, clarifying the nature of the self, which means the nature of our relationships. The self, or particular self, whatever name you've got, exists in relationship with others. It comes about when, you know, when, when you're just sitting there, like in meditation, doing nothing in a way, the, the neat part is the self will just move to the background, right? Because it doesn't have to be up here. But, you know, we can bring it up in front of ourselves, you know, uh, during meditation. But we're, it's going to be most obvious in social interactions or in dialogue, right? It always feels for, for beginners like the thing, I was meditating long and uh, myself just disappeared, <laughs> you know, it just, it's just back here. The minute you don't get what you want, the self arises very strongly, doesn't it? The minute you're insulted or something, or even praise, and suddenly, well, I'm back, you know. So uh, we, we have to work with others. We just can't get away from it, you know. <clears throat> Some people are more social than others, but... Um, the reason we have a Sangha Jewel is not so they're just enlightened people walking around, but that we actually uh, exist in dependence on others. You won't find out who you are unless you also find out who other people are. Fish? Yeah. There's no solitary enlightenment. Now, of course, there are some people who think there's solitary enlightenment. But uh, the Buddha many times, and all the teachers said, well, I know that would be nice, but there's no solitary enlightenment. You have to think about that for a minute, right? Because it seems like you should be solitarily enlightened. But <laughs> there's, no, there's no solitary space, right? It's like you think we own the space, but we don't, do we? Do we own the space here? We don't own the temple. Can we, can we take, like, can we carve out a piece of empty space and take it with us? No, we don't own the space. There's no private enlightenment. Disappointing, right? 
<laughs> Actually, it's really good news. <clears throat> so the, the ceremonies and empowerments and workshops we do here are all to bring people together so we can interact, find out uh, what our relative self is about and realize that there's no solitary enlightenment. That's extremely good news. I'll let it sink in. <laughs> I don't hear any applause. <laughs> so the uh, major impediments um, <clears throat> to scholarship are um, misunderstanding. You know, when we are trying to understand the words of teachers, the words of others, um, usually you're going about it in, uh, as information only, right? But of course, um, all the books, uh, all the lectures are, in some sense, uh, you know, instruction manuals and not descriptions of reality. They're not just maps. They're particular teachings given at a particular time and place to a particular group of people with particular interests, right? So there, there, are some, there are some teachings like the Heart Sutra that are seen as definitive in a sense that it has to be this way no matter what, but that's still a teaching giving at a particular time and place to a particular group of people. If you go to India, you can go, you can go visit, you know, Vulture's Peak, right? It's not that big, so how did 1,800 people get there? <clears throat> so in reading, um, we generally are educated in a Western style, which is to um, try to understand uh, every sentence before we get to the next sentence. And it's supposed to be a one-off. And we're so freaking arrogant in the West that we think, if we're not understanding it right away, the author wasn't very good. Isn't that so? Or the professor, this is too obscure. <laughs> That's why many times uh, Europeans uh, coming from maybe dense Germanic tradition, you know, they, they're the first ones that really dug into, uh, you know, Buddhist texts, because they were really kind of like, we have no idea what this means, you know, but we're going to dig in where Americans want to learn everything right away. But fortunately, we have many good scholars now. But still, when we're reading the text, anything, um, it's like reading poetry. You have to let it sink into the heart, right? There is logic, of course, but it's still heart logic. And there is explanation, but it's still heart explanation. So the real practice lineage, the real enlightened lineage, is, is not just information. It's like someone's talking to you, just like I'm talking to you now trying to connect with your heart mind, not trying to just explain how reality is from an objective point of view that doesn't include human beings. Right? We don't, you know, that's, we're talking to these other strange failed chimpanzees, right? So, um, you know, the, all the talks, they're using logic and examples and experience, but they're trying to connect with someone's heart. So they tend to be poetic, right? And they tend to repeat themselves. <laughs> when people go, well, um, Nipa Ramshi were saying the same thing. Yeah, he is, but you haven't gotten it yet, so he's going to keep saying the same thing. You know, that's that's what they do. That's what Islamas do. Like, so, like I mentioned, my old teacher Yeshu John, Yeshu John would just, uh, you know, just kind of like Lama Zopa. Um, which you know, many, not many people here met. Like, would spend like three hours just talking about bodhicitta until you just like there's blood coming out of your ears, and you think I, you know, but you, you're thinking intellectual. Like, I've got it. Like, I got the, you know, because we're thinking from the. I got the concept. Think, let's move on. That's that's so American. Like, I got it. Okay, can we move on to something more interesting now? Okay, but. You know, he wouldn't. 
It'll just be until you finally give up. Like, okay, I, I just okay. I'm I'm just gonna try to love everybody. Okay, all right, okay, okay. You know, until you just gave up, right? So that's also the way the texts are. They're circular and poetic and logical and linear, but they're really ad hominems, right? They're sermons meant to connect with people, not just abstract descriptions of reality, even Heart Sutra. Because they're talking to somebody. It's a dialogue, like a platonic dialogue. Like Avalokiteshvara and Shariputra is talking, and the Buddha is creating the situation. Very interesting. So I'd like to stop here, uh, not go on too long. So, you know, we have like six minutes for questions. No, I'm just kidding. We have longer if people have some some comments. Uh, and then afterwards, we'll have some. Do uh, you think we have much food today, Patty? <laughs> Do we have a lot of food? I don't know. Who's, who's the food person? Yeah. No, don't run to Safeway, but yeah. It's, I, I don't like, like, I, it's just terrible wasting food, right, you know? So, so I'm open to Greg takes the lead first out of the block. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lama. <laughs> I wonder, um, I know that your focus has been on Buddhism and the Eastern traditions. I wonder if at any point you had sort of looked at Western traditions and fun, like how did we get to the point where we don't value spending time still? Was it just sort of like a random decision or trend that just perpetuated or was there? It was the Protestant Reformation that did it. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I think I think there's so there has always been a Western contemplative tradition for sure, but probably modernism and you know um, the breakup of uh, kind of monasticism you know uh, in the West to some extent contributed to that right. So uh, you know I have a deep respect for that you know I, um, I did take four years of Latin and. Um, you know, read many of the Western um, Catholic teachers and contemplative teachers, right? So, um, you know, it's there. Um, I did a workshop with um, Father Keating, who started the contemplative prayer movement. Um, uh, and uh, used to come out to uh, the Trappist Monastery in Snowmass. Um, <clears throat> And uh, he also started a group in uh, Folsom Prison, which ended up kind of becoming, interestingly, my Buddhist group, because the uh, folks in Folsom Prison that were getting together to do contemplative prayer were mostly interested in just meditating. And when Father Keating couldn't come anymore, um, I kind of absorbed that group. So that was interesting, because then I got to know um, Father McGuire real well, the Catholic chaplain who became my um, contact person at the prison. And so, um, and also I was uh, a member of uh, the group at um, Christ the King Passionate Center in um, Auburn Boulevard in Citrus Heights. Anybody been there? Walk the labyrinth there? God go, it's beautiful. Just off of Marin, you know, being back. So there's a strong contemplative tradition, but generally, um, at this point, um, so much of Christianity is very active, right? The, the, the last 500 years have been, let's go out and enslave people and colonize and make them Christian, you know, and, um, and let's get all modern and there just isn't time to do much meditation, but there, there still is a strong uh, contemplative tradition. You know, of course, um, people wear Thomas Merton, right, you know? Maybe not, right? So he was a convert and became a Trappist and wrote a, wrote a lot. And, um, became friends with uh, one of the um, most realized uh, Dzogchen masters, Chacho Rimshe, and like that, and we became friends. So there's, there's a lot there, right? But 
you still have to just sit still. <laughs> you know, you can't always be making petitionary prayers and, you know, fixing yourself and, you know, meeting, you, you know, just, you know, Father Keating, you know, it's contemplatives talk the same language, you know, they're not, contemplatives aren't that interested in arguing theology, a waste of time, you know, you're just talking on an experiential level and then it's very much the same. This morning in the meditation class, you were talking about various different things to focus on during meditation. Yeah. And previously I've used the breath or a mantra, but mm. then you had talked about meditating on a feeling. And I was wondering internally what that would be like. I found myself trying to meditate on happiness or something like that. And I couldn't quite capture inside myself how to do that. Usually to meditate on happiness, you know, we have to have some content, right? So the feeling it's hard to just kind of pluck a happiness feeling out of the air we have to like think of a time when we were happy or people that make us happy or us trying to help others be happy and create kind of a context and scenario and then the, um, the felt sense of feeling then arises in our body and mind and then we, we we stay with that so we usually have to create some kind of scenario it's hard to just say okay be happy you know like <laughs> It's easier to say, just be pissed. You know, it's funny. It's really, yeah. <laughs> but we have to create that. So, of course, one of the most profound meditations, the meditations on the four um, Brahma Vihara, sometimes called, uh, or four immeasurables, you know, immeasurable compassion, love, equanimity, and joy. So these are emotions that uh, don't have any conflict and are not... Um, uh, you can't you can't run out of them a lot of emotions have some emotions have or more kind of feeling tone emotions that are kind of right on others and they have a half-life so you know compassion love joy and equanimity are unlimited they won't exhaust us and they you can't run out like that <laughs> mm -hmm. Online, okay, and then Ellen. I saw Ellen there. So, someone speaking up, Marie. No. Okay. Why don't we go, Ellen, and then maybe Marie will pick up. Thanks, Salama. I'm always interested in understanding my excuses for not meditating. <laughs> um, one of the things I notice these days, is it feels like there's so many different opportunities, programs, teachers coming, practice groups online. There are all these fantastic opportunities for, uh, you know, getting exposure to experienced Buddhists and practicing with other people. Mm -hmm. But it it's also feels like if I do all those things, then it takes a lot of meditation sessions, you know, if you spend a couple hours online, you just used up 10 or 20 mm -hmm. sits. Uh, yeah. So how, how do you how do you recommend we choose? Or do you think it's possible to do all of those things in, in a balanced way? So like just coming from my own experience, like, um, you know, I, I met uh, Trung Pemshe in 1971. And then a lot of different teachers uh, in a lot of different readings and so forth. So um, then, uh, you know, in, around 1985, met, you know, my root teacher, just studied that, just did that until he died. Um, so I'm very teacher oriented and I go like, okay, I, I know, you know, it's like I studied from, so you actually, you know, Miller, you know, and Middlebury and did everything. So at, at some point it's like, this is it, you know, I'm not, I don't need to get any more other teachers. Of course, I would see Dalai Lama and, and that. So uh, I brought, uh, I brought a lot of different teachers here. In fact, we have one of my friends, Geshe Sewan, came in soon in March. Um, but there are a few people here that just said, you know, Lama Jimpen really knows and, you know, I'm just going to do it. So the, there are a few people who just do exactly what I say, and they've made great progress. I'm not saying that in an arrogant way, but at some point you just kind of, you just say, this is it, you know? So when I met Geshe Udron, I'd already studied enough, you know, intellectually, Trungpa Rinpoche, um, 
Chadgut Rimshe, um, Dijim Rimshe, you know, uh, many wonderful Kargi Lamas. And like, this is my Maha Siddha, this is the person. So there was like chunk like that. So it was, you know, unfortunately I had like 15 years. I could really dial in. And it takes that level of intensity, you know, to do it actually, you know, to just kind of, um, you know, because we're always a little bit like this. So I, I know that it takes maybe for a lot of people, let's say it takes 12 years to kind of settle in on a practice and a teacher. Because because you, you we should look around because a lot of times, you know, people just glop on and they, they don't have the confidence and certainty because they don't know what they're doing. And I really respect that. And the majority of people like in Sacramento don't know what they're doing, right? They haven't studied with other teachers, so they don't know, you know. Um, one, one way, you know, it's like <laughs> to say, okay, this is kind of funny talking about me, but we've had all these A-list teachers here, right? They wouldn't be coming if I was an idiot, okay? So, you know, so there's a little bit like, oh, they're calling me Rimshe or Lama or something, so you should have some confidence because you, you should look at the students and the teachers around other teachers, right, as a way of gaining confidence. You know, but at some point, the confidence has to come within saying, you know, I'm, I'm going with this. Because the, uh, the same way with the practices. So Vajrayana has a number of different practices, which are, um, you know, really fantastic. And we, we, we have a little bit, it feels like a smorgasbord sometimes, right? But that's because we know people have different personality characteristics, uh, certain you know, different DSM categories, you know, uh, like that. So it isn't just one size fit all, right? But at some point, you can't you can't do every everything, right? So my teacher like leaned in big, Kalachakra and Vajogini, okay, just get these plus plus Shamata and, and, and Bodhicitta, of course, you know, the foundation stuff. But like. You know, at least do this, right? You know, do these practices, which are hard because Kala Chakra and, and Rajagini have s slightly different, you know, like one has illusory body, one doesn't, right? <laughs> so you're thinking, what am I supposed to do? But um, it's possible to do both, right? But uh, it, at some point, you know, it, things come, come to a point and you just kind of lean in like that. So like that. But it is very helpful to have a, a variety of teachers and to then to gain the confidence like um, and generally here in the West, particularly Sacramento, you know, sometimes people have to leave. So over time, people go, well, Lama, I, I thought you didn't know what you were saying. And then I went around to all these different teachers and they're saying the same thing you are. <laughs> so <laughs> like that, like that. So I'm really trying not to say anything new. But, you know, um, uh, at some point you have to bring it back. You, you just have to go, well, I've got all this, but I have to be on the cushion. Otherwise you're keeping collecting things. You're, you know, collecting objects and, you know, collecting stuff and uh, intellectual stuff too. So at some point you, you just have to kind of do just a few things and get really good at them like that. Um, so, you know, you, they, there's a phrase that the Tibetans would tell about themselves. In India, they practiced one deity and mastered a thousand. Here in Tibet, we practice a thousand and master none. But you know, you you still you know uh, you know have to um, you know find the right teacher. So uh, for me, Geshe Odon brought everything together. It was very very lime, very. Um, uh, Dzogchen oriented also. Uh, for Galuk, that was a little bit different, but you know, coming from present Dalai Lama and fifth Dalai Lama, you know, very strong. So really a yogi style. Not not so much, you know, not actually didn't have a temple, didn't just stayed in people's houses. So very much like me, Rapa like that. So I always tried to start a temple under him. He goes, no, just see how people sit in your apartment. <laughs> just go to their houses. But it is better to have a temple because we can create more energy this way and um, not everybody wants to open up their house, right? Like that. So those are just some hints, some ideas. But yeah, maybe, maybe, oh, Doug. And Marie, Marie's family. 
Oh, Marie's got her little hand up. No, let's hear from Marie. She's smiling too. I can see it. So I, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you so much for bringing up um, Lojong and and the different parts of, of the entire practice, you know, time on the cushion and, and the Sangha Jewel, because, you know, that's something both that I've struggled with. And what I love about Lojong and Tonglen that springs from that is that it kind of brings those together and, and synthesizes them in a way where, well, like you just said, it brings it all together in one package. Yeah. And then it's funny because over time, realizing that really, as you just said, what I'm really working with is just that sense of self. And as that comes up, so um, really encourage people to explore uh, Lojong and uh, maybe even join me for Tony. Um, but thank you, Lomila, because that has been a powerful. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when you talk about meditating on yourself, which interacts with other people, uh, does that does your idea of the self get better, or is it just some Thing that you have to tolerate because it works in the world in other words is there do you eventually get rid of the ego aspect of that the ego aspect is is taking the relative self and uh you know trying to make it more solid or, or um on on top of others you know not realizing that um our even our personal self that we identify with comes about through relationships with others right so um generally uh, when we realize we exist in relationship with others um, and others exist in relationship with us, then we, we become kinder, you know, and more compassionate like that. So the self-centeredness um, actually ends up being very self-critical, right? Um, you know, we shoot ourselves in the foot kind of like that. So uh, it's very interesting. Of course, when we're wounded, you know, um, you know, through things in the real world, we tend to think, okay, if I just separate myself totally from the people wounding me, I'll be okay. But we have to heal from that eventually and be with people that are kind and, um, and be kind to them too. So then we can have a self that exists in relations because that automatically feels good. So interdependence and uh, seeing how things uh, appear and disappear in this um, uh, rhythm, this mandala, is a joyful and blissful, you see. That's the way things exist. So in Buddhism, we say the way things exist is actually uh, loving and satisfying. It isn't cold, hard reality. What's cold and hard is the delusion, is the isolation and the um, estrangement and the alienation that so many of us feel, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. Hello, my name is Adam. Adam. <clears throat> um, can you talk about, you know, like preparation or what is somebody who's not had a teacher ever? Right. What What kind of person um, is ready to seek a teacher? as opposed to being like, oh, I have a stack of books and when I'm depressed, I read them. <laughs> and then when I'm feeling good, then I'm not reading them, you know? So this, you know. This was a problem even in India and Tibet and particularly, you know, so a few books have been translated, you know, how to, um, that were written in Tibetan and um, in Sanskrit and so forth, you know, how to relate with the teacher. Because it, it's always problematical in a way too, right? So um, now there, there's uh, um, a few books that I've recommended. I know I'm going to books, but um, Lama Shempen Hukum in uh, Britain, uh, her book, The Guru Principles, kind of useful, I think. Anybody here read that? Maybe, yes, Andrew. Um, 
Alexander Burson, Dr. Burson, maybe 20 years ago, wrote something how to relate with a spiritual teacher. So um, there's, there's, there's some guidance there. Um, the truth is, you, you, you know, you have to um, try things out a little bit, right? So it is hard, particularly, you know, if, if the person doesn't speak your language really well. Um, but find, you know, we're still going to have problems with an English speaking Lama or, or Roshi or somebody like that. Um, it's the same way with finding a good therapist, right? So, you know, okay, let's go on Psychology Today and you read their, you know, the description and they all sound fantastic. <laughs> um, um, but, uh, you know, you, you, so most of it is we, you don't want to give yourself 100%. You want to explore. Like you're interviewing somebody, which is entirely impossible. Like what, what are your values and what would this look like? So you never want to just kind of like magical, do magical thinking and just kind of, you know, I found you in a vision and I'll just follow everything you say. You, you, you want to like, you know, explore a little bit. And that starts by finding out, sitting with yourself informally too, like, well, what am I really, what are my goals and objectives too? That's important. So it, uh, it's okay to interview people, honestly. And um, <laughs> so uh, uh, when I was when I was studying with uh, Joshi Sasaki Roshi, you know, well-known Zen teacher. Um, uh, uh, he visited Boulder, of course, and I decided, okay, I'd, I'd have my mom meet him. <laughs> so uh, we had him over for dinner. It was, just, it was so bizarre, this ancient Japanese Zen master in this mansion in Cherry Hills Village. And she said, how do I know you're enlightened? You know, that's my mom. I was in it. And he said, you don't. <laughs> and then, but you know, you have to ask those kind of questions. And I didn't give up on that kind of the teacher meeting thing, you know, so when I was studying Zen with Robert Aiken Roshi, also past wonderful teacher, um, again, another lunch with mom probably my mommy issues, you know, I want approval or something. And uh, so she asked, well, do you think you're doing any good? That's a good question. And uh, where she said, well, I, I'm giving it a good push. It's a nice answer, you know. So um, those are those are good questions, right? You know, what are your credentials? And what are you trying to do? You know, like, let's just let's put it out there. So, um, you know, that it's okay to come with, you know, with a checklist. Like that. It's reasonable to ask, you know, who did you study with? And, you know, what, what did you learn yourself? You know, that, like, that's important. See what people say. Um, in Asia, you know, that they're, they do that too. They're, you know, much there's a lot more information about teachers in Asia among you know in India and Tibet because they see people right so that's the way to do it maybe we should stop soon unless there's one one more hand somewhere no I don't see any hands oh okay I don't Maybe Susan, maybe mm -hmm. she's not raising her right arm. Maybe it's a <laughs> <laughs> As a matter of fact, that is true. <laughs> you know, I, just, <laughs> I just wanted to make a comment about what you said about um, the relative self being, and this um, experience that I'm, I'm currently undergoing I'm asking myself, and this sounds trite, well, I guess, but well, maybe it doesn't. Is that like, who is this person doing all this? I'm having interactions with all sorts of people. 
I mean, the hospital was a was a, an experience in itself. Mm. But the whole relationship thing, like who is it that's having this experience? What is it's it's um, I don't have an answer for that. I mean, there isn't an answer, I don't think. But it is um, profoundly um, affecting. Mm. It's it's really really interesting. I, sort of recommend it, not hurting yourself, but watching these interactions with people and going, who's, who's interacting here? It's very yes. interesting. Yes, yes, definitely, definitely. You know, so uh, the who is the big who, you know? Usually when we think who, we're thinking, you know, we're going back to the limited who, right? So uh, one, one way just to kind of think about it is uh, a little bit metaphor, but also it's like, if we think that um, we're not in here and they're not in there, but we're, we're in the middle. So it's kind of like, um, that's why uh, couple therapy is interesting. Um, you know, to look at a couple and they're, sometimes they're talking you or he or she, but then they also start talking about the relationship, right? But that's a magical being, isn't it? The relationship. Like, I'm not happy about the relationship. So do you mean you're not happy with him or you know, like, is it? Because that's a little different, right? But, um, that there's a hint there that, uh, that there's there's something intelligent when we say I'm not happy about the relationship. It's abstract and it's very concrete and real at the same time, isn't it? So there's a little hint there. You could say I'm not happy with myself. I'm not happy with him or her or it. <laughs> but when you say I'm not happy with the relationship or I want to work on the relationship. Of course, that's what I want to hear as a therapist. When I hear, when I hear like, <laughs> could you just fix her? But they go, okay, Judy, don't don't schedule them. <laughs> but if somebody's saying, I want to work on the relationship, and if both people say that, you're in, right? You can do it. You say, I want to work on the relationship. I mean, people come up with bullshitty things, but um, it, it's different than, you know, I, the problem is him or the problem is her, you know, of course, we all have our individual problems, but if you say, I want to work on the relationship, then we're getting to the idea of who's actually doing all this. Thank you, Susan. Medicine Buddha for you. <laughs> it's fantastic. We, sh we, sh we need to stop here. So we'll do closing prayers and then eat something maybe. Oh, no.